Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's great. So we're here tonight. It's been a long day. Some people have been at the polls volunteering. Some people have been standing in lines. And we all want to talk about it. And the perfect person to help us do that is Niall Shore. Well, so you. thank you, Niles, for coming tonight. And, and we're going to start with a little contest. And the person who gets the right answer gets a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Democracy doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> but here is the question. Uh, where, we all know that one of the great things about our American system is that we get to vote for our president. So the first person who can tell me where in the Constitution it guarantees us the right to do that. Where does it say that the citizens have the right to vote? for the President of the United States. I'll give you a little hint. It's not on the last page. It's between pages two and eight. And there's an article called The Presidency, which might be a good place to look. So why don't we take a minute or two, because I want to write something on the board. Um, the Constitution or the Declaration? In the Constitution. Right. And find me where it says the people, of, the citizens of the United States have the right to vote for the President of the United States. Well, so what's the answer? That the people don't get to vote for the Exactly. Oh. Um, as late as 1860, the state of South Carolina picked electors by having the state legislature pick them. Um, in the early 1800s, fewer than half of the states had people vote for them. It was the state legislatures that did it. So what would happen tomorrow morning if the state of Maine said, you know, there's a lot of work with all this election stuff. We're going to go back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we know for Maine, they weren't voting in the early 1800s because when did Maine become a state? Oh, you guys are good. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the question. Since who got the right answer on whether there was the right to vote. Who went first? Who? Which state? No, no, who, ga who gave me the answer first? I thought. Uh, I think it was. She gets the cookie. No. He gets the cookie. No, we, sh we, we share it. Share the There we go. That's what makes America great. We're going to share the cookie. I can't have too many cookies. All right. I think okay. we share it. Or pies. Oh, or, pies. or pies. Okay. I'll put my order in. <laughs> All right. Um, there was a recent article Sunday in the main newspaper which said that a little over 60% of the people in Maine voted in 2022 and that was the highest percentage of any state. Uh, and then when you considered only registered voters, it was even a little bit higher, 71%. That good enough? All right, so we got some yes, some no. So here's the question. What, if anything, should we do about it? Can we do about it? Um, so there are three options. One, which is the one that I always think is the best way to start, is what can we do to encourage people to vote? Mm -hmm. Make it easier for them. Okay, so uh, we could extend early voting. Okay. Um, should we change it from Tuesday to Saturday or Sunday? Or, do, or is that not the big deal? Make President's Day a, the voting day. Mm. Well, but that's February. Well, change it. <laughs> change President's Day? Yeah. Um, back, back them up a little bit. All right. I know. Uh, uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln might be a little put I off, know. but they'll survive the experience. But, but yeah, that, that's a solution, is make it easier, make it a holiday, 
Uh, so nobody really, you know, or not many people, because no matter what you do for a holiday, somebody's got to work. Um, all right. Uh, anything else? Uh, I'll start start with uh, kids at a uh, at a young age um, and educate them on the uh, the fact that you if you don't have you don't have a say if you don't vote. Okay. So go back to the days when we actually taught civics in school. Yes. And and the importance of what government does. Yes. All right. So what does government do? Serves the people. Are we down with the question about all the options? No, not at all. But uh, I'm a detour kind of guy, so we'll we'll come back around. Uh, so the question right now is: since we want people to vote for government, why should they? I mean, what is it the government does that's so important that they want to participate? All right, so one of the things that government does, and maybe the most important, and I'll paraphrase you a little bit, uh, government does for us the things we can't do by ourselves. Okay. All right, I mean, I can't build a road in front of my house. Um, the government can. You know, I can't build a bridge to New Hampshire. Uh, I can't do a lot of things on my own. Um, you know, I, I can't by myself provide fire safety in Berwick. I mean, there's a lot of different things. Um, suppose some, you know, a kid says, well, you guys are doing fine. I don't really care. Is that a problem? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so how are we going to encourage that person to vote? Pay him $47. All right. Well, it, and that's actually one of the things I think is a good idea. We, we can offer people Money, you know, and, and how would we do it? What would be the mechanism? When uh, they go to vote, they get a, a credit, a credit card or something. You, you could do it right then, or the other possibilities, you could do it uh, as an added refund on somebody's income tax. Yeah, there has to be an incentive. I mean, we, yeah. we live in a transactional society now, unfortunately. And persuasion just doesn't cut it today. It's a quid pro quo kind of society we've morphed into, sadly, again, but that's where we're at. So you're correct. There needs to be some kind of inducement, uh, motivational aspect to it. Yeah, you want, you might. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, All right, I, I'm so not sure what that incentive would be. You know, it could be a tax credit. It could be, you know, as you're suggesting, a, a, some kind of reward system, a Dunkin' Donuts card or you know, As I remember it, the state of Maine uh, created a program where kids who graduated high school in 2021, 20, 22 maybe, went to free community college. It's not enough. That's not enough of an incentive. I mean, it, it, it seems like a pretty nice, is, is, I mean, quite seriously, is that not enough of an incentive? I mean, is government just doing policies not enough? I'm going back two questions. Okay. I think that the role of government is to serve the will of the people. Okay. And people, if people don't participate, then it's they, the people elected have no way of knowing what the will of the people is. And some of the framers knew that exactly, that an uneducated populace was better for most of them. Because if they couldn't understand what was going on, then they were more likely to get elected. In today's world where we have so much information, I feel like an incentive is a little scary to me, but I still think you could make it easier, for example, to register to vote. Because I don't, I moved from New Hampshire to Maine and I figured out how to do it, but um, it wasn't as simple as it could have been. Well, a, a number of states have what it's called motor voter. That is when you go to register for your license or register your car, mm. they mm. register you to vote right there. That something attractive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we need to figure out a way to get them more people to do that. All right. So are we all willing to pay a little more in taxes for that? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, everybody? Good enough? Not me. <laughs> well, I quite, all right, why not? I'm sitting here listening to all of this incentivizing and thinking, here we go again. The rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer, the rich will call the shots, the rest of us will suffer the consequences. I don't think we should incentivize, incentivize voting at all. This is a right and a privilege as a citizen of the United States of America. Okay, so how about... We don't, if, if you don't want to vote, you don't vote. All don't right. complain. Uh, That's what my father always said. If you don't vote and you don't express your opinion and take that option, then keep your mouth shut and don't complain when things don't happen the way you want them to happen. Let me take this is a, your right. In a different direction. Can we make it mandatory? And then we'll talk about how to do it. Why not? I don't think so. I think it's, it's a right. Mm -hmm. that's what I a mean. right is something you either take advantage of or you don't take advantage of. And that's your privilege to do or not do. But you also, along with rights, the part that people forget is that that comes with the other half, which is responsibility. It's your responsibility and, and to go and vote. And isn't one of the ways that we recognize responsibilities by making something mandatory? No. no. I think just the How opposite. How do we recognize responsibilities? Responsibilities come with the right. So if you want the right to vote as a citizen of the United States, your responsibility is to show up to the polls and vote and to also do research. Don't go in, you know, ignorant of the facts. Go in with the facts, the data, the information. Make a right, so judgment based on your personal situation and exercise that right. So if I understand what you're saying is, um, it's not an independent responsibility, meaning you don't have to vote if you don't want to, but if you want to vote, it's on you to do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Rachel? I almost feel like the, there should be a penalty if you don't vote, like a, a surcharge. Like if, because if you want to vote, that's benefiting all of us, right? It, it, but you can't make it mandatory. But if someone chooses not to vote, like a non-voter tax or a surcharge. And, and some of us would say a non-voter tax makes it mandatory. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Well, it doesn't make it mandatory. They still have the right not to do it, but they're going to, they're going to. Well, all right, now I you're mean, going to send me down another their... detour. <laughs> um, <laughs> As a fact, that the way our criminal justice system works is, in some ways, it, I mean, it's all voluntary. If you want to commit murder, go ahead, but there's a penalty. I, you know, you could quibble whether that's mandatory, don't commit murder or not. And the same thing with this. I mean, if, if you're going to get a penalty for not voting, it kind of sounds mandatory. But you're right, you can choose not to and then take whatever it is that's going to happen to you. All right. Um, I mean, yeah. that's, it happens with property taxes. When you buy a property, you are obligated to pay your property taxes. That yes. doesn't mean you're going to pay your property taxes. And if you don't pay your property taxes, you're going to be penalized for it. Foreclosure. Right. Well, Someone's going to take over your property. Don't you think that people are, are penalized if they don't vote? Because then afterwards, if they start complaining about what happened as a result of the voting, they really have no say because they didn't vote. You know, so, I mean, that's what happens to people in this country, is that we are different from, you know, the Europeans where we came, where a lot of us came from, where they have people, uh, their citizens vote in the 90s, 90%, France, England, you know, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The United States is abysmal when it comes to not voting. We have this individualistic thing that we uh, like to, uh, to say, you know, it makes us different from the rest of the world, but actually it's, you know, it makes us worse because people have, have uh, abstained from, uh, from making decisions because they feel like they don't have good choices. You know, and that's part of the big problem. Sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna say, the, the biggest difference between those two scenarios, though, is if you don't pay your property taxes, you're published in public so that everybody knows you didn't pay. Your, but yeah. nobody knows whether I voted or not. No, but you do. Right. 
So that's personal mm. responsibility. But like when you're talking about, um, you know, there, there being consequences and you can't complain because you didn't vote, nobody's going to know whether you voted or not because there's no visibility. Of they say there is, though. There's been thousands of commercials, commercials. about... Uh, who you vote for is private, if you vote is public. Eventually. And they said, your fa family and friends <laughs> can see if you vote. I thought, mine don't care. <laughs> but yes. that's, yes. that's just what it's, it, it's been like every other commercial. There is a dangerous precedent. Elon Musk is giving mm -hmm. people money to register. Yeah. And he's doing a lottery, a $1 million lottery per randomly at his well, those people have signed this petition to register. That's a danger. That's a danger. I, I agree, but I, I, you still live in Philadelphia, so I still read the Philadelphia newspapers. Right. He hasn't actually paid anybody. Well, oh, they promised to pay. He's been, he's been sued by the district attorney. Yeah. Judge threw it out of court, uh, in part because he hasn't really paid anybody. But you're right. Uh, you don't, getting back to what you said, yeah. you, know, you don't want rich people involved in the you know, process. saying, all right, everybody who votes the way I want, I'll give you a hundred bucks. That's buying votes. Quoted That's buying votes, and that person. we assume that was illegal. Oh, yeah. But could we have a, a law that says you can't run for office if you didn't vote the last time, two times, three times, whatever? Yeah. That'd be nice. Well, you could try it, but it would probably be in court for quite a while. Wow. Why? Uh, because I think people, uh, there are people who would object to it. I mean, on on what basis? People object to uh, you know to everything. Yeah. You know, no matter no matter what it is. You know, there's always naysayers about everything. You know, for example, in the uh, um, at the Berwick Town Hall, there was somebody with a desk that uh, where the person asked whether you wanted to make it more difficult. Um, you know, to be able to uh, to vote by having um, IDs. You know, and and things like that. And, you know, I said to the person, you know, very simply, is that I believe in inclusivity instead of exclusivity. You know, so that you want people to want to vote and you don't want to make it harder for them by putting obstacles in the way. I, so. I, I agree. And I think, I said, you know, that the best way to make change is, is to have it be voluntary. But um, the other thing that you discover is there comes a point at which most people have decided whatever it is they're going to decide, but you still have some holdouts. Um, and, and some would say that's exactly what the federal government is for, meaning uh, the states decide what it is they want to do. Most kind of reach uh, some plan of what's going to happen, but you've got a few holdout states, South Carolina right. always being one of them. Uh, and at some point, somebody has to come in and say, this is the minimum of what's acceptable. Um, is that the way that we ought to operate? Yeah, Rachel. So let's say that we did make it mandatory to vote. What would the penalty be if they didn't participate? Well, it, it, it depends on what, how you enforce it. For instance, if, if the rule was you cannot run for office if you have not voted in the last election to whatever you want to do. Simple. You can't run for office. Now, for most people, that's not a big to do because most people don't want to run for office. Uh, you could make it a monetary you know, penalty. Um, but that's but, just like what I was saying, like put add a surcharge or you know, yeah, making I mean, it mandatory and then you add a surcharge because they didn't participate. Yeah, we used to call them fines, but you can call them surcharges, whatever yeah. you want to do. But are there yeah, any other ways to do it? Well, well, wait a minute. Hold on. So I wanted to talk about yes. this idea of, well, somebody said um, you couldn't run for office. You couldn't run for office if yes. you didn't vote. Well, I'm new in town, but the town I really last came from, there were, I was on overtime, the zoning board, the planning board, the budget committee, the scholarship committee, because there were even state legislature in New Hampshire because people were not running for office. Because even, reg even signing up to register to vote, 
is more than some people want to do, and they have the right to not do that. That's their right to not participate in this oh, that, country. But that's the question. Is it? Yes, I think it is. Because wh why, why is it all right for them to let everybody else do the work? The same reason that people can pick up trash on the side of the road on Earth Day and other people don't have to because it's a matter of choice. But not everything is a matter of choice. I mean, some things example, are mandatory. Right, like, you can't drive your car without a license. You've got to get a license. You have to wear seatbelts. You have to wear a seatbelt. So, so, you know, we right. decide as a society you some drive things. You can a vehicle without a license. You just can't get caught driving your vehicle without a license. No, for real. Okay. Uh, that's one way of that doing true. it. Um, I'm not suggesting or encouraging. <laughs> I, I no. know, but, uh, but we just, agreed. In this is true. Yeah, just you, uh, you can always into... agree. You can always choose to violate the law. Uh, I, I don't think that that means there's no penalty for violating the law. It just means maybe you're lucky, maybe you're not. Not and not quite the I'm same. Sorry, thing. I got here as quickly as I could. I'm not going to ask you if you went beyond the speed limit. <laughs> okay, good. Right, Larry? Yeah, in, in reinforcement theory, which I'm not going to deconstruct for you all, but positive reinforcement gets it done. Punishment went out with penny loafers, frankly. I mean, it's a disincentive. You know, the old model was catch your child doing something wrong and punish them. The new model is catch your child doing something right and reward them. And so reward gets the job done in a much more, I think, cleaner way than punishing people. I mean, that, that doesn't work. All right, so what, what rewards, jail. other than money, what rewards can you give people for voting? Uh, you could be, a, 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 this lady said, a, a tax credit of some sort or some right, kind money. of incentive. You I mean, know, it could be monetary. One form or another of money. Sure. A, a tax, and, you know, uh, a gift card for somewhere when you come on election day, uh, a chocolate chip cookie, something. <laughs> yeah. So we, we give some people an incentive, a positive, a positive feedback for coming to vote. Yeah. Every, you, you, I don't know where you could be in this country and not know there was an election today. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So you've chosen not to vote and the only reason you're going down there is to get the chocolate chip cookie. So now you're, you're really sort of angry and resisting because somebody's telling you what to do. So you're not really watching and you're not really informed. You're just going down there because you have to get the chocolate chip cookie. So you just walk in, they hand you about, and you just mark the first thing that comes to mind. Now, is that really the person I want voting? And, and that's how, where how often is that going to happen that way? All the people who don't vote. I would and, say a good portion of them. So they, they choose not to vote because they can't be bothered. But a chocolate chip cookie is so important to them, well, they're going to come down and vote but otherwise, for the chocolate chip otherwise cookie. Otherwise, there's some sort of penalty, right? We're, we're saying. No, you're just know. not going to get a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, then they won't vote. All right. Because, I mean, we're talking about a positive reinforcement, not a penalty, meaning I'm going to give you something you wouldn't otherwise get if you vote. I don't see how that benefits. The, 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 the forwardness of society, just making, giving, doing some creation to say people who don't vote, get them to vote. If you can't figure out that there was an election and you don't care enough to decide what you want, then don't vote. My vote counts more. I, I mean, I guess part of the problem that I see is that uh, there's this whole group of people in this country that have been disenfranchised. These people want to vote. Their vote, their right to vote has been taken away, whether they have been incarcerated and state laws are constantly changing to keep them from voting because, you know, the powers that be in these individual states or jurisdiction think, think that they're going to vote the wrong way from what they think they should vote. So I think that, you know, we're, we're quibbling over um, incentives when there's this whole, you know, large group of people in this country who want to vote. Yeah, you know, and I think that they should should be able to vote, and I think the concentration should be on, you know, obviously on those people who want to vote, who are qualified to vote, and uh, should be it should be made available to them. I mean, we can't always, 
you know, we, how, how, do, how does it go? Is that you cannot expect to others do as you would do. And, you know, that's what it comes down to, is that I can't expect my neighbor to vote if, you know, deep down inside of uh, that person, they don't want to vote. There's, there's really nothing that I can do about it. Can you expect your neighbor not to drive 75 miles an hour up your road? Uh, can I? Can you, do you have the right to expect that your neighbor will not drive 75 miles an hour up your road? Well, if they have common sense, they won't do it. But not everybody has that. that. So answer my question. What's that? Should they be allowed to drive 75 miles an hour up your road just because they want to? No. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what allow means. I mean, I don't think I have There's no right. penalty. Okay. Somebody can get in their car. Yes. They live on one end of the block. You live on the other. Yeah. They get in their car and they drive 75 miles because they just love to go fast. Okay? Because they want to. They like going fast. I will do everything in my power to stop them. <laughs> and if, well, how would you do that? You're not going to stand in front of them. Speed bumps. Um, speed bumps. Speed bumps. I have, I have, a, I have okay. a lot of nails in my arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those have, of us... I have a shop full of nails. <laughs> for those of us who are not carpenters... Um, <laughs> So we want to suggest yeah, that point. wanting to do something is enough. We, we should have no expectations of anybody in our society because everybody should get to do what they want. No, I think it's a start. I, I agree. We should always start with explaining, with talking to people about what's a reasonable way to act right. and uh, hope that they will do it. Well, I mean, that was why I suggested before that it start with young children. Yeah, I agree. If our, if yeah. our education system actually did its job educating uh, kids, then I don't think we would have this kind of problem. Well, I'll just say there was a time when our education system, I think, was very successful. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I just want a full disclosure here, a longtime civics teacher here at a high school in New Hampshire where it's mandated that civics is taught in the schools. But that's not what I was here to say. I wanted to talk about the difference between, um, pun I'm going piggybacking on what you said regarding punishment versus, what is it, um, positive reinforcement. There is, in voting for me anyways, I don't know about the rest of you, an intrinsic reward in being able to vote to having the right to vote at, you know, that happened for me when I was 18 because of my age. But the people before me, they had to go to Vietnam, but they couldn't vote. Um, there are, that's an intrinsic reward, and that's enough for me to want to vote. So how do you pass it on to the next generation through education and example? But we're not getting good examples in the national election we should be looking down the ballot anyways, in my opinion. But that's getting off topic. I mean, just one little thing mm -hmm. um, is that um, today was, was great because um, both of my children called me and we talked about voting. Yeah, right. So, and they're in their 40s. And um, that was great. Yeah. Somebody here. I know John, but I think Teresa said it. I, I was going to speak to the issue of education and say that as an educator, our hands have gotten more and more tied as to what we can and cannot teach. I'll give the example of a child in the room who took his backpack, which happened to have a 12 inch pipe in it, in it, which no one knew, and bashed the other kid over the head. My response was to immediately grab it and say to him, stop it, you're not being nice. I, was the one called on the table, not the child with the backpack who hit the person, because I use the word not being, the words not being nice, as opposed to you are being unsafe, which is the legal way around saying the same thing. I think that the intrinsicness you're talking about was instilled in me as, from my father, which is why I say it's my right to vote and I can choose or not choose to do so. But in the 1970s, when prayer was taken out of the schools, I understand the religious concept of that, 
But what was also taken out of school simultaneously was the difference between right and wrong, good citizenship, and just common courtesy. It went so far extreme in the school systems that I think that is a lot to do with how people treat each other today, why they sort of don't want to vote because they don't feel they get anything out of it. And I don't think they have that intrinsic attitude of, this is something important and I need to step up and get there and vote. And why did that happen, do you think? I think that the pendulum took that, take the prayer out of schools, swinging way, way to the other side to the point where you couldn't say anything to a student that was the least bit tangentially attached to a moral decision. You know, just to tell a little kid that's not nice, that's common language that most parents would use to say, that's a good thing, that's a bad thing. Well, good and bad is a, is a judgment, therefore it's a moral thing, therefore it's religion, therefore you can't say that. It became an extreme, in, now, it, and we don't teach civics in a lot of schools anymore. We don't teach common sense in do, schools do you, Was anymore. that universally true or just in your particular schools? I think it's universally true. All right. Um, I think common sense should start to be taught at home. Like, my originally what I wanted to comment was like on the teaching civics in school. How can someone, an adult, care about something if they know nothing about it, if they don't know why it's important. I, I don't know what else to say to Seth. Like. That's good. That's good, John. I go back to the 75 miles an hour? Yes. We, <laughs> good. Speed things speed, up a little bit? Always a good idea. There are speed traps. Yeah. And there are towns that have no police at all, like Lebanon, and people go as fast as they want. But if, if they get caught, but there's a penalty. Yeah, but there's nobody to catch, catch them. Well, that, that's, you, you raise an important point, which is you should never set a standard of behavior if you're not willing enforce. to do something to enforce it. Right. If you can't, then don't set it. I mean, if you can't, enforce a speed limit, don't have one. I, I agree with you. No. Um, my gut feeling tells me it's better to try to figure out a way how to enforce it than not to have one. But I, I, I agree, there are some situations where no matter what you do, you're not gonna enforce this, so give up. Mm. Uh, look around every town in America, the word marijuana, <laughs> um, right? For 50 years, I think I could say on a personal level, uh, America has been trying to figure out how to enforce marijuana laws. And at some point just said, we can't, we give up. So sometimes, you know, we, we may not remember, but we've read about prohibition. Same mm -hmm. thing. An, an attempt was made to make something illegal. It couldn't be enforced. Uh, in part because people didn't want it to be enforced. People, you know, nobody asked, well, not nobody, but not many people wanted prohibition. A certain group did. They got it, and within a relatively short period of time, it blew up in their faces. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, just one, one more thing is that um, in, our, in our age right now, there are there are people who don't want other people to vote, mm -hmm. and um, is that there's you know groups groups of people uh, I won't I won't name names, but uh, we all know who they are. They would rather that certain groups d um, don't vote. Right. Native Americans, uh, people in uh, who live in low income neighborhoods, people who are. Um, you know, who don't have the same opinion as, uh, as we do, and so therefore we are going to try to disenfranchise them. You know, all along the, uh, the southern border there are states 
um, that have made it more and more difficult to, uh, you know, for people to uh, to vote, people who are in prisons. So, I mean, we are what we are left with, and in fact, the the worst one I heard was from a Christian nationalist group was that uh, husbands should have the absolute right to tell their wives how to vote. And if that woman does not want to vote like her husband, she should not be allowed to vote. So this is the kind of country that unfortunately we are, we are living in right now, is that um, even though we would like everybody to be able to vote, everybody to have the free right to vote, um, we don't. And okay. so, I mean, that's part of the, the problem. I mean, the United States Supreme Court, in its infinite uh, wisdom, uh, eviscerated the Voters' Right Act. I mean, how many, a how many parts of that act are still there? One. One, One yeah. yeah. So, this is what's happened in our country, is that um, only the people who dare to vote, vote. You know, we all stood in front of Berwick Town Hall this morning, you know, before 8 o'clock, waiting for them to open the doors, and it was peaceful, it was quiet, people were talking amongst themselves, and it was a great experience. But it was the first time since I've been in Berwick, which is 24 years, where I saw um, people in those uh, colorful vests and two police officers that were armed. It's the first time I've ever seen that. You know, so things have changed. Thank you. So, I hate to say she's my sister, but my sister, who does not live in Maine, um, is not going to vote because I hate politics. And she's on public assistance. And I said, how do you think you get your public, and I hate to get into that, but how do you get your public assistance from people that vote? I hate politics. So can we, edu can we educate these individuals? I don't know how, if, but, or maybe your benefit next month might be a little less. I, I don't know, but that really bothered me that she said so firmly, I hate politics. I said, what do you know about politics? Nothing. Well, I will tell you, I hate politics, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Okay. <laughs> All right. For me, there are two different things. There's government, government and, politics. and there's partisan politics. Um, I, I contribute to candidates. But I'm not somebody who is going to sit down and make phone calls to Arizona to convince you to vote for whoever it is I want you to vote for. Uh, I think it's one, my wife was the best at it in the history of voting. Nobody was better at working the phones than my aunt was. But I hated it. Um, so I understand the distinction, and that distinction is a fairly common one, but we don't make the distinction when we talk about it. So when somebody says, I hate politics, they're lumping everything in together. Yeah, and, and somebody said, oh, you know, we don't have the greatest candidates often. Sometimes we have spectacular candidates. I mean, we just look in our lifetimes. Um, both at the presidential level, U.S. senators, you know, Margaret Chase Smith, it, a Republican. I, I will not disclose my party affiliation, but it's not Republican. Um, you know, I respect her, respected her as a leader. You know, we have had examples of lots of people who have been wonderful leaders. We, and I will agree, we've had more examples of terrible people who have been miserable leaders. But it, this also goes back to something I, I often hear and that I'm, I'm hearing now, which is we have this idea that unless everybody agrees to something, something's wrong. Um, so, yeah, some people don't want people to vote. All right. You know, tell me what year in our nearly 250-year history everybody agreed on everything. Because I missed that year. 
I must have been busy. I didn't read the memos. But I don't remember a time when everybody agreed on everything. All right. Uh, I actually went back this morning and, and looked at early elections for president, but you could do it for anything else. Other than the first two, which were George Washington, who, you know, is as close to the divine, you know, to a divinity as we're going to get in this country. Put him aside. Uh, most elections have been relatively close, meaning a blowout is maybe 55 percent, maybe 60 if somebody really, you know, 1964. We all remember the election of 1964. Lyndon Johnson versus Barry Goldwater. Um, now you think you've seen ugly politics? Have you go back and Google the Daisy ad? Yeah. All right, that's dirty politics, uh, and that was done by Lyndon Johnson, who I was a little too young to vote for, but. Um, you know, I would certainly rather have him as my president than Barry Goldwater. The, the idea that, uh, that we, unless everybody agrees, somehow we can't move forward. We need to get past that. You know, this is a country that's based primarily on majority rule. What's happened over the last 20 years is, as you're, I'm going to say this a little differently than you said it, but there has been a concerted effort to have minority rule. That is, to have people who are not, who don't have the majority of the votes, figure out a way to subvert the rest of us. That's sort of what's going on um, far too often through a bunch of mechanisms. One, not letting people vote, questioning the integrity of the vote, uh, throwing up enough roadblocks that you can't do it. And then um, one of the things I had planned to talk about today, and the more of these we do, the more you'll understand. Uh, I rarely get to the things I plan to talk about. Oh. <laughs> um, was the notion of slavery in America. And, and it, we should talk about that later on. But one of the reasons I bring it up now is in this country, we have laws, and we also have social reality. Meaning, you know, who, who has the right to vote, who has the right to own a business, who has the right to have a driver's license, all those are laws. But how we treat one another and who's uh, sort of welcome in the community is a social question. And... We, we have a, a battle in this country of those who are trying to run government through social pressures. You know, sometimes you have candidates who think by calling somebody ugly, somehow that's a, a tool of government. Um, that's not the first time this has happened. Um, for those of you old enough, and I'm not sure there are any, but maybe a few here and there. Um, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so it was an era of civil rights. And part of the reality of what was going on was schools being desegregated, jobs being desegregated, government, you know, you were having people get elected and all of that. But behind it all, the question that always was there was, would you want your sister to marry one? And you could fit whatever group you wanted into the one. That's when things really change in this country. Um, and I'll give you, a, a, for, for me, which is an astounding example. Look at the way people view homosexuality today. All right. 30 years ago, kiss of death if you were a politician and gay. Um, often if, you know, people would, would hide their sexuality because socially it was so unacceptable. In a very brief period of time, 
relatively speaking, that all changed. Now it's who cares? We recognize gay marriage. Um, you know, we all have friends, family, and, and life is beautiful. And how did that happen? And, and, and I'll give you an example um, of what I thought may have been the most persuasive political campaign I've ever seen in my life. And it was here in Maine. And if you remember, and I don't remember the year, maybe 2010 was the first time gay marriage was on the ballot. And it lost, if memory serves me correct. And then a few years later, it came back again. But this time, and the, and the first time it was sort of very legalistic. You know, people don't have these rights and they have these penalties and, okay. The second time, and I remember there was an ad of grandma and grandpa sitting around the kitchen table and a couple of the grandkids were gay. And to my last breath, I will always believe it was at that moment when the rest of us could see that this was about family and human beings and, and real life, that that changed everything. And, and that was a very long-winded way of saying what we need to be better at doing is explaining to people how this is all real life. It's not what other people do. You know, it's not some notion somewhere else. It's real and it happens every day. And we're never going to get everybody to agree on everything, but you don't need to. Um, I spent most of my career being a lawyer for very poor people. And I will tell you, in some places I've lived, um, and, and Anne was even much better at this than I ever was, some of the most powerful and effective political camp, political not in the sense of partisan, but in, in the sense of convincing government to change, were poor people. Um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan had a line in a song that I think uh, is one of the main themes of American history, which is when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And we've seen, you know, the movements of the 60s, I believe in large part, were about a lot of people realizing they had nothing left to lose, so why not? try to gain some power and do something to make their lives better. And that worked. Um, you know, the problem now is we think if somebody disagrees, oh, I've got to stop because I've got to get everybody to agree or it doesn't count. Really? Tell me how many, how many of the elections that are taking place literally as we speak today are going to be won 100% to zero? No. All right. So it's OK to have people disagree. So we shouldn't worry because you want to do something and not everybody is going to agree with you. And let, let me rephrase what you said slightly differently. Um, yes, it's true people want to deny voting, but I think it's bigger. I think we're going through a transition um, of who is going to be in power. Who, who is going to, which groups, which people are going to be able to influence what really goes on? And there are groups that understand that they've been in power for many years and their time is up. And the other thing that we ought to think about is nobody ever gives up power voluntarily or easily. There's always a fight to the end. So we should not be surprised at all of the stuff going on because the people who are doing all of that stuff understand that they're going to have to share power with the rest of us. And they don't want to. And I don't blame them. I mean, you know, if, if I was in charge, would I, why would I want to give up being in charge? Being in charge is a good thing. Yeah, but don't you think that there have been people uh, in the recent past who have given up power gracefully. Yeah. Every now and again. Joe yeah. Biden will go down in history as one of the great examples. Al How many Gore. more? Al Gore. Sure. Yeah. 
there, that there, was there, there, there have been a few, a very, very small few. Right. But, and again, that was an individual who at a particular point in time said, I'm going to do the right thing. Um, but what I'm talking about is large groups of people who have had power. Large groups don't give up power that easily. You know, Joe, Joe Biden gave up power. Did the Democratic Party give up power? I didn't see that. I missed that memo. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we need to recognize that. Not, and I'm not saying that there's a war going on. What I'm saying is that there's a transition going on, and transition is never easy. Yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking about what I consider to be the elephant in the room when you're talking about who's running the country. And I, I don't really think it's any individual or really even any party. I believe it's the big corporations, the major corporations. And they're controlling everybody from the top down. Well, maybe, except maybe when you get to town and, you know, somebody's selectmen or whatever. But there's a lot of corruption that can't be denied ever since corporations and businesses were allowed to have moral convictions and opinions. That's one of the things. All right, so well, citizens te united. Yeah, tell tell me the that. three biggest corporations in America today. Me? Well, I mean, uh, no, group, yeah. the group. Tell me the three biggest in America today. Exxon. The Exxon. Um, Exxon. All right, Amazon? Yeah, Amazon. Okay, um, who else? Uh, Apple. Uh, Apple? All right, so we've got ExxonMobil, Amazon, and Apple. Um, two of them didn't exist 30 years ago. All right? The world changes. Corporations come and go. Are they corrupt? Sure, but, but very few. And ExxonMobil would be one of those that has lived a very long time. Um, but even ExxonMobil understands its days are numbered. Uh, I, I know very little about it, but I guarantee you they have units that are figuring out how they can make money off of solar power and wind turbines and oh, stuff they, like they've that. Been, they've been doing that for yeah. 50 years. They, they bought up all the patents. So and, they control, they've been controlling it from the beginning. And, and, and they understand that there will come a time yeah. when that's where their money is going to come from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't worry about ExxonMobil surviving. Yeah, and neither are they, no, because in some ways they've been smart enough to change. They, they, they right? They're, they're not the corporation they were a hundred years ago. Here's an example about ExxonMobil and gas companies. Think back a couple of years ago, watching football, there was an ad about ExxonMobil. We're taking algae and making and making fuel out of it. You remember those ads? What happened to that? They did it, and then they said, "We don't need to right now because we have fracking." So we'll just put this over here, and we'll just keep doing what is easy. So they're just doing what's easy. When the time comes, we'll all be getting fuel from algae again. Well, Unless they have something else, like, you know, they're, it's going very fast, the, the types of engines and fuel things. The profit motor. The profit motor. Well, we no. all need fuel, and we all need yeah. energy. There's, it's, yeah. As long as you can provide it, you'll yeah. make money. Yeah. Yeah, just, um, you know, kind of in a macro way, in, in the largest umbrella, it's really about the abrogation of personal responsibility. And that's really what's driving the whole thing. No one wants to be blamed for anything. No one wants to take responsibility for it. They'll, you know, the famous line, I didn't do it, you know. Let somebody else, let somebody, I just want to go out and play. And kind of we're infantilized, Peter Pan syndrome, which I think society is suffering from in a lot of ways, don't want to work hard, don't want to do anything, want somebody else to do it. So I don't know how you inculcate that back in an intrinsic versus extrinsic motivational piece. But to me, I've just, everywhere I look, no one wants to be held accountable. And, and, and I think that's part of what we're talking about tonight, <coughs> on that responsibility for government, for yourself, for others. And we'll let, let somebody else do it. Let, let me totally and completely disagree with you. Good, no, so I like that. And the example <laughs> I will give will include your wife and include the town of Berwick. Uh, 
We moved here 14 and a half years ago. All right. Uh, I know many of you have been here much longer than 14 and a half years. But look at the change in this town in 14 and a half years. And it happened because people got together and decided to make it happen. All right. We have a representative of Berwick Community Media recording this program. There wasn't Berwick Community Media 14 years ago, I don't believe. Um, and look at the miraculous, and I will use that word, miraculous work that it does. Look at the library in which we're sitting. This library didn't do this stuff 14 years ago. I mean, look at the downtown. We now almost have a downtown. We didn't have one 14 years ago. Why? Because some people got together and decided it was time to take responsibility and to make some change. Envision Berwick, this is at least the third generation of it, maybe the fourth generation, I'm kind of losing track. Um, this town has been a great example of people taking responsibility. Uh, the Board of Select people 14 years ago was not going to make the Hall of Fame of great legislators, let's put it the nice <laughs> way. Um, and you can go back and read all of the stuff that happened during those years. Um, but things changed because people in this town decided they wanted to make change. And it happened. So I agree with you about the problem. I'm just a little bit more optimistic that the solution is already in place in many areas. Not everywhere. I'm not suggesting that. Um, what's the town up north? Millinocket that used to have a mill? And there was an article in uh, Down East, is that the name of the magazine in Maine? Yeah. Um, and I remember it, there was a time when I was on the planning board and I was the planning board representative to Envision Berwick. So I was very involved in what was going on. And there was an article in Down East about why can't Millinocket get their act together and replace the mill that, you know, had shut down. It was exactly the same time that the mill downtown had been sold, had gone into bankruptcy, and something needed to happen. Roll it forward some number of years. I don't think much is going on in Millinocket, but look at this town. So, yes, you're right. Uh, and I agree with you. I've too often seen where the solution to a problem is, it's not my fault. And, and I agree. There are, and I was what's called kitchen sinky, meaning it threw everybody together, which, you know, obviously that's not the case. But let me put it back on you. Then what motivated you? What made you different, Niles, than other folks who let somebody else do it? And I'm saying that in kind of a universal way, that there are responsible individuals out there, certainly we wouldn't be here tonight if we weren't responsible in some way to learn more about things outside of ourselves. We're not just selfish people sitting here, which is heartening at that. But in other words, what is that intrinsic motivation? What are those things that make that catalyst for people to say, I want something different? I'm not just concerned about myself. That's what really I think we're talking about. But to me, they're few and far between. It looks like we're winnowing down. Mm -hmm. those number of people who I, I, are like you, Niles, and that's great, and, and I applaud you. I, I, I will disagree in that. I think the numbers are growing, not winnowing. And again, okay. look at this town. I mean, how many people are doing, you know, some of us walk on Mondays and Thursdays at the cemetery because somebody decided to organize such a thing. You know, it's not the whole town, but it's a volunteer activity you know, that people choose to do, you know, there's stuff going on at the local level that doesn't get covered. Um, and that's where change really happens. You know, I talked earlier about social change. You know, where it happens is where you live, meaning um, we now accept things and we now work on things, not because we want anybody wants press, but it's our lives. 
again, and again, I will use this town as the perfect example. Um, I always wanted Down East Magazine to cover Berwick. And some of you may remember, we actually had uh, somebody, I think he worked for the Portland Press Herald, the guy who wrote the book that about the artist guy, remember, you had him here speaking. He worked for the Portland Press Herald. And I had always hoped that, that they would cover what was going on in Berwick. And of course they never did, and, and that's okay. Um, people change because they know it's what makes sense for their lives. I mean, th that's the incentive that people want and that people have, which is you want a better life for yourself, you want a better life for your kids, for your grandkids. You know, you, uh, I would like to disagree. Just I'm from Rochester, and so it's a completely different no. is a completely different economic makeup. Um, I'm not saying the desire isn't there, but the finance, the structure, the financial st structure to create um, a really caring, active, engaged community. I just think people are not, that's not where their head's at. I think Berwick is a very small town. You have people who are retired. You know, this is going to be, they're not working. They're not, they're just, this is home to them and they want to maintain it. But I think it's very difficult for most communities to achieve what Berwick has achieved with the prime tanning property, um, the library, all the things that have been done over the last 15 years. I don't think it's that easy or realistic to think that that kind of thing is going to happen in all other communities. And also education. I think, you know, you're a very well-educated person. And I do think with education comes curiosity and people, you know, you develop that. That's not just something, well, I guess you could be. It could be innate, but oftentimes it's also something someone has helped build that up in you. Um, and I think that when you have that curiosity, you share that with others, it's promoted. I don't know. I just disagree that it's that easy to enact change. I, I didn't realize I said it was easy. Oh. Uh, I, I, I just said it was oh. true. Yeah, I said that this is what happened. I didn't say it was easy. Oh. I think going back to the mom over here who talked about things starting at home and like the idea that you expect your children to accept personal responsibility and then you expect them to, you know, if people are ex showing examples of how they can contribute to the community in whatever way it is, large or small, I think that's a part of it. I think it's not just top-down rules like laws, incentives, making you do things. It has to start at home. I agree with that because my daughter, who um, <coughs> is in college and very active, very involved, um, this summer actually worked with a group on um, getting the information out to college students on how to vote, where, what they need to do. You know, like, I mean, she amazes me anyway, but, but I'd like to think that my husband and I were a big part of that because we're active, we're doing it. Um, we, my husband especially has had major conversations with her in regards to what's going on in the world. So, I mean, for her, it definitely started at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There used to be a saying that if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. Yes. Um, and I may have mentioned, I, I worked for a number of years in the Pennsylvania Senate as a staff person. And what we all either never knew or forgot is that a lot of people who got started in politics were community activists. 
and just over time, some of them decided self-interest was more important than community activism, but that's where their roots were. Um, so it's not all that surprising or unusual that that's the way things happen. You know, it, it's always been that the grassroots are where change happens and, and where the leaders w will follow if the people want to. You know, I always thought the biggest mistake in the 60s was the idea of power to the people. And I, and I say that only because, uh, and someday we will actually start reading the Constitution, but the first, <laughs> the first three words of the Constitution are we the people. Meaning in 1787, we already knew that power was to the people. Uh, at some point along the way, the people gave up the power. And it's only, in my opinion, has only been, you know, in the last hundred years, give or take, um, that people have decided they want the power back. But it's, it's not a new concept that grassroots is where the power ought to be. And, and it's structured to be that way. But, you know, but as you've all pointed out, not everybody wants to get involved. Yeah. I, Greg. I think, and I don't know, I think this came from the French, the French Revolution, and I don't know who the speaker was who was saying this, but uh, he says, I'm, I am their leader. I must follow them. Yeah. To speak to what you're saying. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, you know, if you read about Abraham Lincoln, if you read about Lyndon Johnson, what you'll find out is they were able to do what they did because they had community groups who were pushing their agenda. And they piggybacked on with what local and national community groups were doing. Th that's the way things happen. Sorry, but this should say we some of the people, because this certainly wasn't created by an inclusive group of people. No, but an inclusive group of people, not inclusive, but more people than the whatever the number that met in Philadelphia voted to ratify it. All right. Uh, it was a great compromise yes. to make that line. Yeah. That's true. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't settled easily. And, and that's why it's a living document. It's not. It was, it it's was a very raucous couple of months. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we do now with um, a whole group of people who want to take power, who want to basically uh, disavow themselves of the Constitution, and who want to rule by fear, and who want to, um, you know, install a document which, you know, a lot of people know about. Um, um, it has, it's a game changer. I mean, it's the first time in American history, I think, that, um, you know, this, that a group of people has uh, basically um, looked at the American people and say, trust us, we know better than you, and uh, you need to elect us because um, we're going to fix all your problems, and we're going to do it quickly, and your life is going to be better, and if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen to you. Let, let me give you two names. Okay. Uh, this is not the first time, and the two names are Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh. Right, okay. All right. Uh, attempts at Nazism and autocracy, pick whatever phrase you like, are not new in America. All right. Um, you know, why was it that the Japanese were interred in California, but the Germans weren't in New York? Just by accident? No, I mean, the things that you're talking about are not new. Uh, the but difference they're, is... They're right we, now. And, and we haven't faced them in a while. And it's always, one, scary when you have to face it. Two, we are the American people. You know, our sense of history goes back about an hour and a half. Um, you know, we, we don't really... 
study it, and, and I will, I was one of the worst examples. When I was in college, my roommate was a history major. Um, and I remember thinking, why the hell were we studying history? You know, the world started yesterday morning. What could we possibly learn? You know, I got older, and I won't say smarter, I just got older, and I understand the difference. Uh, none of this is new. I mean, you know, look at some of the stuff that was going on in this country. It, you know, s the Civil War. You know, pretty big fight between one side or another about who was going to be in charge to the tune of, depending on what numbers you believe, 600,000 dead, three quarters of a million dead. Um, you know, the rhetoric is easy to toss around now. I don't think anybody is really talking about South Carolina coming to invade Maine anytime soon. Um, this is not new. It's just we, we're never taught and we're, we're not used to comparing what's going on now with what's happened before. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we read the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. And, and I fully understand that there is, and, and I don't even want to use the word hypocrisy, but there's a level of compromise. Um, you know, one of the things America stands for is we're willing to compromise our ideology to keep us going. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but it, it's not as, as acceptable as it used to be. And I'll give you an example. Uh, and I may have mentioned this last time, and you'll discover I'm old, my memory is shot, I'll repeat things a lot. It's the way it is. Um, I, in the fall of 2016, uh, I was teaching at um, Midcoast Senior College, which is in Brunswick. And there was, a, the way it's done is a, a memo goes out, you know, propose, you know, submit a proposal to teach a course. So in October of 2016, October, I said, I want to teach a course on the Constitution, and I want all of us to sit in a room and read it from top to bottom and talk about what's in it. Not knowing and fully expecting that the election would turn out a different way. But it didn't turn out a different way. It turned out the way it turned out. So I taught the course, and I taught it that spring uh, and it was fully enrolled, and I taught it again in the fall, and it was fully enrolled. First time I taught it, I asked the question, if you were in Philadelphia in 1787, and you were representing the North, and the compromise that was offered to you was, you've got to accept slavery in the states where it now exists, and in return, the South will join in and stay a part of the United States. Uh, and whether it was 1776 in Philadelphia or 1787, what would you have done? Would you have said, yes, I will accept, and, and we will go over at some point or other in our lifetimes, you know, what the compromises were about slavery. The question was, would you have accepted the continuation of slavery for some period of time in return for the support of the South in the war against the largest military power in the world, with, you know, that held the largest empire in the world. What would you have done? Um, and to my surprise, in the spring of 2017, the first time I asked that question, 100% of the people said we would have compromised. In the fall, when I asked that question again to the second group, it was 50-50. Um, and I think that's what is not popular today, but has always been part of what the American character is, which is we are by nature practical. That is, we want to keep going. And if it means that we have to put up with certain things for a period of time, we will. 
Now, it's easy to do that if you're one of the people who are getting all the goodies. Um, but over time, as you said, you know, we are certainly a more inclusive society than we were 250 years ago. I would expect that that's undeniably true. But if anybody disagrees, now would be a good time to bring it up. Well, we, we should make that question start off next session because I think we'll get carried away with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have to do our homework? <laughs> It's been recorded. <laughs> it has, and I can't even remember what it how, is. How about we do I'm it American this way? In a, the, the, an hour the, and a half. The, it, it's really a discussion of is compromise an acceptable way for us to proceed as an Americans and as an American value, uh, or should we? demand purity. Yeah. I, I, we'll put it that way. And, and we'll go from there. So I put... Do you have any words of wisdom for people on this night, election night, as we go home and stare at the TV for hours on end? It's early. It's early. Don't Blow up the TV. Yeah. Blow up the TV. Yeah. But I want to hear some... You know, I, I, I am annoyingly optimistic. Um, I annoy myself sometimes with how optimistic I can be. But uh, my grandmother, who was clearly the smartest person I ever knew, uh, her favorite phrase was, this too shall pass. Um, you know, there's going to be an America tomorrow morning. There's going to be an America 10 years from now. Might it get ugly in the next four years? Maybe. I hope not. I mean, you know, I, I look at what's going on. I, I think people are fundamentally have common sense and are decent and good and want what's best for the country. The majority, not 100 uh, percent. And so I believe things will turn out right. Could I be wrong? Yeah. Uh, I may have told this story before. I'll tell it one more time. Then we can go. Uh, in 1980, I lived in Georgia. My wife and I were working for the legal, local legal services program in Georgia. And if you remember, the election was Ronald Reagan against Jimmy Carter. Now, Jimmy Carter had been the governor of Georgia and was immensely popular. Everybody loved Jimmy Carter in Georgia. Uh, and I remember thinking, People are going to walk into the voting booth. They're going to see the name Ronald Reagan. They'll laugh. And Jimmy Carter will be president. So I'm wrong a lot. Uh, well, not so much. I'm getting smarter as the years go by. Um, you know, but the point is you control the way things are going to operate. You know, Berwick isn't going to all of a sudden become this greedy, selfish little place. Um, you know, we're going to be a good, decent town where we care about our neighbors and do good. You know, it might be easier if we've got an administration that helps us out. It might be harder if we don't. But the fundamental nature of people don't change. People are good and decent and want to be good and decent. And sometimes they get scared and they don't know how to do it. But eventually they figure it out. So Niles, I think, I think that's very true. And I'm glad for your optimism. But I really believe that things are going to get worse before they get worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you, you, you I, think... I don't have an optimistic view of this. We're, we're, we're in for a rocky ride, whatever is coming. And, and we've never week. had a rocky ride before? Well, mm -hmm. uh, optimistically, I think we'll get through it. Yeah, so? I, I don't think I share the same optimism you. Well, what I said was... We will survive. We will get through this. It sounds like you're agreeing with me. I am agreeing as I disagree so, with you. Yes. So you're trying to be cynical, but the truth is you're an optimist too. There you go. I knew I'd get you. All right. So there is no other choice. You, there, there is an email address up there. Uh, to the extent that you have comments, questions, or suggestions, please 
use that. Um, what, as I understand the way we agreed to function is starting next time, you will all have ideas about what you'd like to talk about that you will communicate to me and to Sharon. And then, you know, we'll pick one or two each time and we'll go from there, which means the opposite is also true. If you don't have anything you want to talk about, we're not going to talk. No penalty. No, well, no that, penalties. The, you, can, you can decide whether coming here or not is a penalty. That, that's your choice. Um, but quite seriously, you know, I, I will be more than happy to do background on anything you want, but this is not a lecture series. I don't need to come here and talk to me about what I already believe. I know what I already believe. Um, I want to hear what you believe, and I'm only going to know it when you tell me what you want to talk about. So please do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.